I would like to stand by the sea. It is there. I have many times. It's something I cared for, I've done it. I'll stand on the beach. On the beach. Well, it was very fresh. But it was hot in the dunes. But it was so fresh on the shore. I loved it very much. Lots of people. People move so easily. Men, men move. I walked from the dune to the shore. My man slept in the dune. He turned over as I stood. His eyelids, belly button, snoozing. How lovely. Would you like a baby? I said. Children? Babies? Of our own? <laughs> Would be nice. Women turn, look at me. Our own child. Would you like that? Two women looked at me, turned and stared. No, I was walking, they were still. I turned. Why do you look? I didn't say that. I stared. Then I was looking at them. I am beautiful. I walked back over the sand. He had turned. Toes under sand. Head buried in his arms. The dog's gone. I didn't tell you. I had to shelter under a tree for 20 minutes yesterday because of the rain. I meant to tell you. With some youngsters. I didn't know them. Then it eased. A downfall. I walked up as far as the pond. Then I felt a couple of big drops. Luckily, I was only a few yards from the shelter. I sat down in there. I meant to tell you. Do you remember the weather yesterday? That downfall? He felt my shadow. He looked up at me, standing above him. I should have had some bread with me. I could have fed the birds. Sand on his arms. They were hopping about, making a racket. I lay down by him. Not touching. There wasn't anyone else in the shelter. There was a man and woman under the trees on the other side of the pond. I didn't feel like getting wet. I stayed where I was. Yes. I've forgotten something. The dog was with me. Did those women know me? I didn't remember their faces. I'd never seen their faces before. I'd never seen those women before. I'm certain of it. Why were they looking at me? There's nothing strange about me. Nothing strange about the way I look. I look like anyone. The dog wouldn't have minded me feeding the birds. Anyway, as soon as we got in the shelter, he fell asleep. But even if he'd been awake, 
They all held my arm lightly as I stepped out of the car or out of the door or down the steps without exception. If they touched the back of my neck or my hand, it was done so lightly, without exception, with one exception. Mind you, there was a lot of shit all over the place, all along the paths by the pond, dog shit, duck shit, all kinds of shit, all over the paths. The rain didn't clean it up, it made it even more treacherous. The ducks were well away, right over on their island. But I wouldn't have fed them anyway. I would have fed the sparrows. I could stand now. I could be the same. I dress differently. But I am beautiful. You should have a walk with me one day down to the pond. Bring some bread. There's nothing to stop you. I sometimes run into one or two people I know. You might remember them. When I watered the flowers, he stood watching me and watched me arrange them. My gravity, he said. I was so grave attending to the flowers. I'm going to water and arrange the flowers, I said. He followed me and watched, standing at a distance from me. When the arrangement was done, I stayed still. I could hear him moving. He didn't touch me. I listened. I looked at the flowers, blue and white, in the bowl. Then he touched me. He touched the back of my neck. His fingers lightly touching, lightly touching the back of my neck. The funny thing was, when I looked, when the shower was over, the man and woman under the trees on the other side of the pond had gone. There wasn't a soul in the park. I wore a white beach robe. Underneath I was naked. There wasn't a soul on the beach. Very far away, a man was sitting on a breakwater. But even so, he was only a pinpoint in the sun. And even so, I could only see him when I was standing. Or on my way from the shore to the dune. When I lay down, I could no longer see him. Therefore, he couldn't see me. I may have been mistaken. Perhaps the beach was empty. Perhaps there was no one there. He couldn't see my man anyway. He never stood up. Snoozing, how lovely, I said to him. But I wasn't a fool on that occasion. I lay quiet by his side. Anyway. My skin. 
I'm sleeping all right these days. It was stinging. Right through the night, every night. I'd been in the sea. Maybe it's something to do with the fishing. Getting to learn more about fish. Stinging in the sea by myself. They're very shy creatures. You've got to woo them. You must never get excited with them or flurried. Never. I knew there must be a hotel near where we could get some tea. Anyway, <laughs> luck was on my side for a change. By the time I got out of the park, the pubs were open. <laughs> so I thought I might as well pop in and have a pint. I wanted to tell you, I met some nut in there. First of all, I had a word with the landlord. He knows me. Then this nut came in. He ordered a pint and he made a criticism of the beer. I had no patience with it. But then I thought, perhaps the hotel bar will be open. We'll sit in the bar. He'll buy me a drink. What will I order? But what will he order? What will he want? I shall hear him say it. I shall hear his voice. He'll ask me what I would like first. Then he'll order the two drinks. I shall hear him do it. This beer is piss, he said, undrinkable. There's nothing wrong with the beer, I said. Yes, there is, he said. I just told you what was wrong with it. It's the best beer in the area, I said. No, it isn't, this chap said. It's piss. The landlord picked up the mug and had a sip. Good beer, he said. Someone's made a mistake, this fellow said. Someone's used this pint pot instead of the bog hole. The landlord threw a half a crown on the bar and told him to take it. The pint's only two and three, the man said. Are oh, you threepence, but I haven't got any change. Give the threepence to your son, the landlord said, with my compliments. Oh, I haven't got a son, the man said. I've never had any children. I'll bet you're not even married, the landlord said. This man said, I'm not married. No one will marry me. Then the man asked the landlord at me if we would have a drink with him. The landlord said he'd have a pint. I didn't answer at first, but the man came over to me and said, have one with me, have one with me. He put down a ten bob note and said he'd have a pint as well. Suddenly I stood. I walked to the shore and into the water. I didn't swim. I don't swim. I let the water billow me. I rested in the water. The waves were very light, delicate. They touched the back of my neck. One day, when the weather's good, you could go out into the garden, sit down. You'd like that, the open air. I'm often out there. The dog liked it. I've put in some flowers. You'd find it pleasant looking at the flowers. You could cut a few if you liked, bring them in. No one would see you, there's no one there. <laughs> That's where we're lucky, in my opinion, to live in Mr Sykes' house in peace, no one to bother us. I've thought of inviting one or two people I know from the village in here for a bit of a drink once or twice, but I decided against it. It's not necessary. You know what you get quite a lot of out in the garden? Butterflies. I slipped out of my costume and put on my beach robe. Underneath I was naked. 
There wasn't a soul on the beach. Except for an elderly man, far away on a breakwater. I lay down beside him and whispered, Would you like a baby? A child of our own? <laughs> Would be nice. What did you think of that downfall? Of course, the youngsters I met under the first tree during the first shower, they were larking about and laughing. I tried to listen to find out what they were laughing about, but I couldn't work it out. They were whispering. <laughs> I tried to listen to find out what the joke was. Anyway, I didn't find out. I was thinking, when you were young, you didn't laugh much. You were... grave. That's why he picked such a desolate place, so that I could draw in peace. I had my sketchbook with me, I took it out. I took my drawing pencil out. But there was nothing to draw. Only the beach, the sea. Could have drawn him. He didn't want it, he laughed. I laughed with him. I waited for him to laugh, then I would smile, turn away. He would touch my back, turn me to him. My nose creased. I would laugh with him a little. He laughed, I'm sure of it. So I didn't draw him. You were a first-rate housekeeper when you were young, weren't you? I was very proud. You never made a fuss. You never got into a state. You went about your work. He could rely on you. He did. He trusted you to run his house, to keep the house up to the mark. No panic. Do you remember when I took him on that trip to the north? That long trip? When we got back, he thanked you for looking after the place so well. Everything running like clockwork. You'd miss me. When I came into this room, you stopped still. I had to walk all the way over the floor towards you. I touched you. But I had something to say to you, didn't I? I waited. I didn't say it then, but I'd made up my mind to say it. I decided I would say it, and I did say it the next morning, didn't I? I told you that I'd let you down. I'd been unfaithful to you. You didn't cry. You had a few hours off. He walked up to the pond with the dog. He stood under the trees for a bit. I didn't know why you'd brought that carrier bag with you. I asked you, I said, what's in that bag? It turned out to be bread. You fed the ducks. <laughs> and we stood under the trees and looked across the pond. When we got back into this room, you put your hands on my face and you kissed me. But I didn't really want a drink. 
I drew a face in the sand. Then a body. The body of a woman. Then the body of a man close to her, not touching. But they didn't look like anything. They didn't look like human figures. The sand kept on slipping, mixing the contours. I crept close to him and put my head on his arm and closed my eyes. And all those darting red and black flecks under my eyelid. I moved my cheek on his skin and all those darting red and black flecks moving about under my eyelid. I buried my face in his side and shut the light out. Mr. Sykes took to us from the very first interview, didn't he? He said, I've got the feeling we'll make a very good team. Do you remember? That's what we proved to be. No question. I could drive well. I could polish his shoes well. I earned my keep, turned my hand to anything. He never lacked for anything in the way of being looked after. <laughs> Mind you, he was a gloomy bugger. I was never sorry for him at any time for his lonely life. That nice blue dress he chose for you for the house, that was very nice of him. Of course, it was in his own interest for you to look good about the house for guests. He moved in the sand and put his arm around me. Do you like me to talk to you? Do you like me to tell you about all the things I've been doing? About all the things I've been thinking? Hmm? I think you do. And cuddled me. Of course, it was in his own interest to see that you were attractively dressed about the house to give a good impression to his guests. I caught a bus to the crossroads and then walked down the lane by the old church. It was very quiet, except for birds. There was an old man fiddling about on the cricket pitch, bending. I stood out of the sun under a tree. I heard the car. He saw me and stopped. I stayed still. Then the car moved again, came towards me slowly. I walked round the front of it in the dust. I couldn't see him for the sun, but he was watching me. When I got to the door, it was locked. I looked through the window at him. He leaned over and opened the door. I got in and sat beside him. He smiled at me. Then he reversed all in one movement, very quickly, quite straight, up the lane to the crossroads. And we drove to the sea. We're the envy of a lot of people, you know, living in this house. Having this house all to ourselves. It's too big for two people. He said he knew a very desolate beach that no one else in the world knew. And that's where we were going. I was very gentle to you. I was kind to you that day. I knew you'd had a shock, so I was gentle with you. I held your arm on the way back from the pond. You put your hands on my face and kiss me. For all the food I had in my bag, I'd cooked myself, or prepared myself. 
I'd bake the bread myself. The girl herself I considered unimportant. I didn't think it necessary to go into details. I decided against it. The windows were open, but we kept the hood up. Mr. Sykes gave a little dinner party that Friday. He complimented you on your cooking and the service. Two women, that was all. Never seen them before. Probably his mother and sister. They wanted coffee late. I was in bed. I fell asleep. I would have come down to the kitchen to give you a hand, but I was too tired. But I woke up when you got into bed. You were out on your feet. You were asleep. As soon as you hit the pillow, your body just fell back. He was right, it was desolate. There wasn't a soul on the beach. I had to look over the house the other day, I meant to tell you. The dust is bad. We'll have to polish it up. We could go up to the drawing room and open the windows. I could wash the old decanters. We could have a drink up there one evening, if it's a pleasant evening. I think there's moths. I moved the curtain and they flew out. Of course, when I'm older, I won't be the same as I am. I won't be what I am. My skirts, my long legs. I'll be older. I won't be the same. At least now. At least now I can walk down to the pub in peace and up to the pond in peace with no one to nag the shit out of me. All it is, you see, I said, is the lightness of your touch. The lightness of your look, my neck, your eyes. The silence, that is my meaning. The loveliness of my flowers, my hands touching my flowers, that is my meaning. I've watched other people, I've seen them. All the cars zooming by. Men with girls at their sides, bouncing up and down. They're dolls, they squeak. All the people were squeaking in the hotel bar. The girls had long hair. They were smiling. That's what matters anyway. We're together, that's what matters. But I was up early. There was still plenty to be done and cleared up. I had put the plates in the sink to soak. They'd soaked overnight. They were easy to wash. The dog was up. He followed me. Misty morning. Comes from the river. This fellow knew bugger all about beer. He didn't know I'd been trained as a cellarman. That's why I could speak with authority. I opened the door and went out. There was no one about. The sun was shining. Wet. I mean, wetness all over the ground. A cellarman is the man responsible. He's the earliest up in the morning. Give the drayman a hand with the barrels. Down the slide, through the cellar flaps, lower them by rope to the racks. Rock them on the belly, put a rim up them, use balance and leverage. I come up onto the racks. Still misty, but thinner, thinning. The bung is on the vertical in the bung hole. Spile the bung, hammer the spile through the center of the bung. That lets the air through the bung, down the bung hole, lets the beer breathe. Wetness all over the air. Sunny. Trees like feathers. Then you hammer the tap in. 
I wore my blue dress. Let it stand for three days. Keep wet sacks over the barrels. Hose the cellar floor daily. Hose the barrels daily. It was a beautiful autumn morning. Run water through the pipes to the bar pumps daily. I stood in the mist. Pull off. Pull off. Stop pulling just before you get to the dregs. The dregs will give you the shits. You've got an ullage barrel. Feed the slops back to the ullage barrel. Send them back to the brewery. In the sun. Dip the barrels daily with a brass rod. Know your gallonage. Chalk it up. Then you're tidy. Then you never get caught short. Then I went back into the kitchen and sat down. This chap in the pub said he was surprised to hear it. He said he was surprised to hear about hosing the cellar floor. He said he thought most cellars had a thermostatically controlled cooling system. He said he thought keg beer was fed with oxygen through a cylinder. I said I wasn't talking about keg beer, I was talking about normal draft beer. He said he thought they piped the beer from a tanker into metal containers. I said they may do. But he wasn't talking about the quality of beer I was. <laughs> he accepted that point. The dog sat down by me. I stroked him. Through the window, I could see down into the valley. I saw children in the valley. They were running through the grass. They ran up the hill. I never saw your face. You were standing by the windows. One of those black nights, a downfall. All I could hear was the rain on the glass, smacking on the glass. You knew I'd come in, but you didn't move. I stood close to you. What were you looking at? It was black outside. I could just see your shape in the window, your reflection. There must have been some kind of light somewhere. Perhaps just your face reflected lighter than all the rest. I stood close to you. Perhaps you were just thinking, in a dream. Without touching you, I could feel your bottom. I remembered always in drawing the basic principles of shadow and light. Objects intercepting light cast shadows. Shadow is the deprivation of light. The shape of the shadow is determined by that of the object. But not always. Not always directly. Sometimes it is only indirectly affected by it. Sometimes the cause of the shadow cannot be found. But I always bore in mind the basic principles of drawing so that I never lost track or heart. to wear a chain round your waist. On the chain you carried your keys, your thimble, your notebook, your pencil, your scissors.
You stood in the hole and banged the gong. What the bloody hell are you doing, banging a bloody gong? It's bullshit! Standing in an empty hall, banging a bloody gong. There's no one to listen, no one will hear. There's not a soul in the house. Except me. There's nothing for lunch. There's nothing cooked. No stew, no pie, no greens, no joint. Fuck all! So that I never lost track. Even though... Even when I asked him to turn to look at me. But he turned to look at me, but I couldn't see his look. I couldn't see whether he was looking at me. Although he had turned and appeared to be looking at me. I took the chain off. And the thimble, the keys, the scissors slid off it and clattered down. I booted the gong down the hall. The dog came in. I thought you would come to me. I thought you would come into my arms and kiss me. Even. Offer yourself to me. I would have had you in front of the dog. Like a man in the hall, on the stone, banging a gong. Mind you, don't get the scissors up your ass or the thimble. <laughs> don't worry, I'll throw them for the dog to chase. The thimble will keep the dog happy. He'll play with it with his paws. You'll plead with me like a woman. I'll bang the gong on the floor. If the sound is too flat, lacks resonance, I'll hang it back on its hook. Bang you against it. Swinging, going, waking the place up, calling them all for dinner. Lunch is up. Bring out the bacon. Bang your lovely head. Mind the dog doesn't swallow the thimble. Slam! He lay above me and looked down at me. He supported my shoulder. So tender his touch on my neck. So softly his kiss on my cheek. My hand on his rib. So sweetly the sand over me. Tiny the sand on my skin. So silent the sky in my eyes. Gently the sound of the tide. Oh, my true love, I said. Next on BBC Two, the second of tonight's performances is Bed by Jim Cartwright. <laughs> 